the City Club Forum. My name is Herb Kim. I'm president of the City Club. This being an exclusive City Club audience, I feel safe in saying, welcome all you saints and sinners. <laughs> Our speaker today is the Reverend Jerry Falwell, founder and president of the Moral Majority. <clears throat> Dr. Falwell founded the Thomas Road Baptist Church in Lynchburg, Virginia, in 1935 with 35 members, 1956 rather, with 35 members, and that launched a fabulous success story for himself and for his cause. Today that church stands with a membership of 18,000. His old time gospel hour on radio and television is broadcast over a nationwide radio and television network, his one hour weekly television program is carried by 392 stations. His 30-minute daily radio broadcast is heard on more than 500 stations. And I think you'll be pleased to know, Dr. Falwell, that your ratings will not suffer by your appearance here today because these proceedings will be heard by a network of close to 70 radio stations across the land. Mr. Falwell also has a magazine with, with a circulation, which I envy, <laughs> Some of it may rub off before the day is over, perhaps of 400,000. His current budget for all his ministries, and I envy these statistics as well, is more than $63 million with more than 1,200 employees. Dr. Falwell in 1979 was honored as the Clergyman of the Year by Religious Heritage of America. Last year, he was named Christian Humanitarian of the Year by the Food for the Hungry International. I trust you will join me in extending a warm, cordial, and respectful welcome to Dr. Jerry Falwell. Thank you, Herb. And at the table where you are, uh, there should be my, the text or the outline of my message in case it's your custom to take a nap at this time. And you can carry that one home with you. It's my privilege to be here. Some of you I know, some I do not, but uh, I'm honored to meet you today. What's right with America? I was born 48 years ago in the same town where I live right now, Lynchburg, Virginia which you probably have never heard of, uh, had it, uh, particularly uh, unless it had been for some of the things that were announced a few moments ago. And I happen to believe it's still the greatest nation on earth, and I, though I thank God for the international uh, scene, there is no place on earth that I would prefer to live than right here. And I am optimistic about America. May I begin by saying that I feel that America... Uh, is in these 1980s, particularly in this decade, uh, experiencing a moral and spiritual rebirth. I do indeed agree with Mr. Reagan's uh, motto, a new beginning. I think that's happening in our country. I'm not speaking at this point from the political perspective, but I, as a minister of the gospel, I believe that we are in fact going to deliver to our children as good, if not a better, nation, the one we've enjoyed. So I'm not here as a prophet of doom. I'm looking forward to a bright future for this country. I don't think it's going to happen accidentally. It's going to come with great travail, effort, sacrifice. And I especially feel that uh, the people in this room, you and I are from various sectors of society, have a mutual responsibility to contribute to the improvement of the society in which we live and, of course, of this great nation. Our president said last January in his inaugural address, this is a nation under God. That was not unique to him. That has been said by many presidents. And that has been said by many members of Congress. And it was said by our founding fathers. They didn't say it's a Christian nation or a Jewish nation or a Mormon nation. They said, and our president said, it is a nation under God. And by that, we generally assume that uh, each of the persons who say that mean that here is a nation built upon the 
Judeo-Christian ethic. And when you use that term, the Judeo-Christian ethic, it's important to understand what we mean by the Judeo-Christian ethic. Again, the simplistic definition would be the principles of the Old Testament, the Judeo ethic, the principles of the New Testament, the Christian ethic. And when you look at the founding documents on the which this great nation is predicated, there can be no denial that this country was and is built upon that ethic, those principles. I'd like to address those principles today. I've made a study of what the Judeo-Christian ethic really is and why this nation has, in 206 years, become, without question, the greatest nation on earth. We're not smarter than others. We maybe sometimes think we are, but we really are not. And it's not our natural resources or the geographical location of this republic. But I, I believe what Solomon said 3,500 years ago. The wisest man who ever lived, Solomon, said, living by God's principles promotes a nation to greatness. Violating those principles brings a nation to shame. That's the Proverbs, chapter 14 and verse 34. I strongly believe what Solomon said. Our founding fathers were not all saints. Nobody ever accused Thomas Jefferson of being a fundamental Baptist. And uh, Benjamin Franklin and all the rest. But without question, again, they were men very much influenced by the Judeo-Christian principles laid down by the early Puritans and pilgrims and religious people who came here seeking religious freedom. But all kinds of problems then, just like we have all kinds of problems now. And in spite of those problems, the principles prevailed and a nation was carved out of the wilderness, and through great distress and times of trial, two centuries later, still stands as a monument to the fact that living by God's principles brings a nation to greatness. I've been concerned that since World War II, along with our prosperity, uh, we have begun to forget what made us great. There's a tendency for all things to operate that way. Individuals sort of do that kind of thing. We start off humbly, and God blesses us, and we forget the principles that brought us to where we are. And then oftentimes we're reminded by going back to where we were. That happens to families. That happens to businesses that become great by exercising certain principles of the uh, free enterprise system, and then down the trail somewhere, uh, the bigness submerges the principles and the big business ceases to be the healthy and big and thriving business it once was. I think that after World War II began to be the problem in this country, and we began to forget those principles that were unique to America. The first of the seven principles, and they're on the sheet that you will be taking home with you, is the principle of the dignity of human life. That is not a Christian principle alone or a Judeo principle alone. You'll find the major religions of the world appreciate the dignity of human life. America was built upon that principle, and I've given you some verses in the Judeo and the Christian ethic that you, in your private study, if you wish, may pursue. This country, with all of our problems and in spite of our critics, has always stood by the sanctity of human life. I would remind you that those are not Soviet troops massed at the Polish borders. Those are not, uh, those are not American troops. They're Soviet troops. And they're not American troops that are in Afghanistan at this hour. And if you look back through our history, you will find that with all the aberrations and problems and and the uh, violations of our own principles, generally speaking, America has always stood up for the dignity of human life, wherever in the world that dignity was being challenged. And I believe that God honors that, and God has honored that. He con continues to honor that. And I'm often asked uh, to justify how, as a minister of the gospel, I could support President Reagan's policy in El Salvador. Well, I happen to believe that uh, 
freedom in Central America impacts upon freedom in North America. And I happen to believe that what the president is doing, I support him totally, is the only rational and sensible thing one can do. It's not idealistic. It's not perfect. It is, uh, there are no perfect solutions to the problems facing our human family today. But I'd much prefer to stop them in El Salvador than Florida or Texas or Southern California. And we so quickly forget that the uh, Soviet goal is not uh, Cuba or Nicaragua, both now in the Soviet camp, but uh, world conquest. Mr. Khrushchev said it properly. We'll bury you. That's their goal. That was, that is their goal. Well, I enjoy freedom. And so as a minister of the gospel, I, I speak out against those things. And I personally feel that freedom is the basic moral issue of all issues. I do not agree with William Sloan Coffin or the Berrigan brothers or Jane Fonda or Ed Asner at this time or others. I agree with Mr. Reagan. So the press gets that correctly, I'll repeat it. I agree with Mr. Reagan that we are, in fact, uh, fighting for our life. And if we're going to scream, we should scream in advance, not after the fact. And so Mr. Reagan's enemies are my enemies, and they're yours too. The free enterprise system in this country, I think, hinges on the success and perpetuation of it. And what I'm talking about here today, as far as I'm concerned, uh, business in America and the free enterprise system is being weighed in the balances today along with the moral issues. And we go up or down together. We don't all agree theologically. I doubt if there are two people in this room that theologically agree on every issue. That would just about be true in every room. But we all should agree on one thing, and that's the dignity of human life. And if I were invited to speak uh, to the Soviet Church Conference that is coming up, and I haven't been invited, uh, I would point out that... Um, the 142 million people who died directly and indirectly at the hands of Lenin, uh, Marxism, the Soviets, the Chinese, Reds, uh, since 1917 to the present hour would bespeak the fact that this country is still is that country that respects human life. Yours is not. And I firmly believe that if we're going to build this nation and rebuild it, We've got to be concerned about our children and our children's children. My wife and I have three children, 19, 17, and 15. We love them. We thank God for them. And I've said this in pastors' conferences everywhere. Uh, what should it profit a preacher if he saved the whole world and lose his own children? I go home every night, if at all possible. I have breakfast every morning with my family. We take Saturday every week together uh, to do just family things. I, I believe in that. But I want my children, 30 years from now, when I'm out of the picture, to be allowed to come to a platform like this and say what I'm saying without any fear of any soldiers at the back door. And so I'll do my yelling in advance, the dignity of human life. I do think there's been a great violation in recent years in this country of that principle. It began in January of 73 when the Supreme Court in Roe versus Wade ruled abortion legal on demand has resulted in 10 to 12 million deaths of little children since that time. More Americans have died by abortion since that ruling than have died in all the wars we fought in our 206 years of history. I certainly believe when the life of the mother is at stake, there's certainly a right for choice, and uh, mom and dad and the doctor certainly have a moral decision of self-defense. But this open game on the unborn, I think, is a violation of the dignity of human life in this country. And if God was angry with Adolf Hitler for the destruction of six million Jews, I think we have reason to believe that God might be a little displeased with this country today that uh, is participating in biological holocaust. That's my conviction. We've allowed the Roman Catholic Church to fight that battle alone all too long. Today, evangelicals, fundamentalists, and uh, many Americans I have joined in the battle for the civil and human rights of the unborn, particularly that fundamental right to life, to exist. There's a second principle on which this nation was built, and that is the principle of the 
traditional monogamous family, which I believe begins when a man legally marries a woman, period. And yet at a 40% divorce rate in this country today, we, we've got to face up to the fact that the family, that traditional husband-wife relationship, must again be maximized and prioritized. We preachers need to preach more on the family. That is not to say that we're going to discredit those who have been through two, three, four family breakdowns, but it does mean that we ought to preach the ideal and, and encourage young people to shoot for that ideal of one man for one woman for one lifetime. A nation is only as strong as the families within that nation. And I feel that somehow since World War II, with the assistance of Hollywood and the assistance of the television industry and the assistance of many social engineers, have forgotten the fact that the family is the basic unit in any civilized society. The family, the home. I scream bloody murder about the major networks. I don't believe in censorship. You need to ask me rather than believe the newspaper. And of course, Herb accepted. But um, I, uh, I don't believe in censorship. But I do believe that uh, we parents and leaders have a reason to be concerned that there is so little emphasis beyond Little House on the Prairie and the Waltons and one or two others on families where a man and a woman love each other and have children who love and respect their parents. There needs to be a role model other than uh, the playing up on the minority problems that do exist. Sure, television should present life the way it is, but it should also present uh, the fact that 93% of all Americans believe the husband-wife relationship is the ideal. And that means we don't have to promote homosexuality as an acceptable alternate lifestyle. I do believe in civil rights, housing, accommodations, etc. for homosexuals, contrary to what you've read. But I do not believe that we should condone it, whether legally or otherwise, as an acceptable altered lifestyle. It is not that. It's moral perversion. And our young people need to know that, need to hear that. And while we should love the homosexual, we should deal with homosexuality for what it is, and that's wrong. And somehow, in the past several years, we've begun to make right what is wrong. And we're creating a syndrome of situational ethics in this country that is not good for the nation. Ministers have never had a problem loving people, and yet at the same time speaking out on issues. Our whole ministry, if it weren't for violators, we preachers wouldn't have a job. And homosexuality is no more a violation than promiscuous heterosexuality. I want to make it very clear that I do not think that a homosexual is worse than a man who runs around on his wife. They're both immoral and both need help. And there's help in the gospel of grace as far as I'm concerned. And we have a counseling ministry and reach out to those people. But at the same time, as any fair and honest doctor would do with his sick patient, we try to be honest with the person to whom we're extending help. And we tell them what you're doing is wrong. And we'd like to help you out of it. We'd like to help you up and not down. The family needs to be rebuilt. Beyond that, the principle of common decency. And again, you can search the verses later. But I would say that there was a time in this country when modesty, decency, were just an accepted, uh, accepted principle, unwritten principle of the American lifestyle. Uh, I'm 48. When I was a youngster, the only pornography around our town available, I mean the, the dirty stuff, was available illegally in the back halls and recesses of, of pool, of billiard halls, etc. Today, when you walk in the convenience store or the grocery store, it is at the eye level of the five-year-old child. I don't think that's good. And I do not, do not think the framers of the First Amendment had Bob Guccione in mind. I think they were thinking more of uh, that which damages and uh, hurts others, and I do think that they were very much for the freedom of press and the freedom of speech and the freedom of religion to the end that that did not affect adversely other people. I think pornography is very demeaning to womanhood. It makes women to be objects instead of uh, creatures of God, precious as they are, and it is also demeaning to the value system of boys and girls. It is the question of telling people what they can read and cannot read 
And you're not going to prevent people from getting what they want. But it is to say that we don't need to jam it down the throats of our sons and daughters by making our living room cesspools. And uh, by, on every movie theater, finding it necessary to have a bedroom scene with no details left out. I think that there are certain boundaries. We're not talking about going back to Ozzie and Harriet. Uh, we're not talking about Father Knows Better. We are talking about four-letter words. We are talking about uh, bedroom scenes. It would seem that they could stop at the doorknob and leave the rest of the imagination. And so our children today, we have three children, and we don't shelter them. They know what life is all about. But I would prefer they learn the values of life from their parents, pastors, and teachers, not from the television industry. And I think the time has come, and I want to commend the television networks. This past year, uh, 81, 82 year over the previous year, our own surveys indicate a 27% decrease in gratuitous sex, a 13% decrease in profanity, and even a 6% decrease in violence. That is why we did not participate in the Coalition uh, for Better Television's boycott. We feel the networks are beginning to act responsibly. And uh, I think in that light that we have an obligation, they haven't gotten where we would all hope they would be, I would say, but they're making moves in the right direction. And if next year that same uh, amount of improvement is registered, and year after year at least, it has bottomed out and turned up a little bit, and that's the first time in 10 years that's happened. So there are good things happening. But common decency, I think, is beginning to prevail, and that is a principle that's important in our society. I would go on talking about the, uh, the principle of the work ethic. Uh, we have somehow, gradually but surely in this country, uh, propagated a philosophy that because you belong to the human race, and the human family owes you a living. There's not a principle in Scripture to support that, and there certainly is uh, none in society. Uh, we, because we are born into the human race, we have an obligation to society. And uh, if you want to use the Judeo ethic, it was in the garden where God told Adam, by the sweat of your brow you'll own your bread and earn your bread. And in the New Testament, it was Paul who said, if a man will not work, neither shall he eat. Of course we should take care of the aging. Of course we should help those who cannot help themselves. Of course we should have compassion uh, to those uh, who are in need. But we have raised up a generation, I would suggest two or three generations now. And it isn't the fault of those generations. It is the fault of the society and the government and the leadership that has allowed it. Uh, a group that uh, believes that I am owed a living because I belong to the human family. And if you will remember, this nation wasn't built on three-day work weeks. It was built on six-day work weeks and not eight-hour days, but 12-hour days. I'm not suggesting going back to that. I'm suggesting there's a principle there, and we, uh, we have 5,000 students at our college. Your son is one of them, and he said hello. But uh, we, we teach the young people there. Many of them don't have to work. They're like, they come from families that can support them. The first day in chapel, I say, hey, if you, can't, uh, if you don't need to work, why don't you go on and work anyway? Find yourself a job and help some kid who needs help. And because it's going to be good for you while you're here, not only to learn how, to make a living, but learn how to live, and learn how to take care of yourself, and learn how to be uh, self-sufficient. And work, as far as I'm concerned, is a part of character building. And this country has become lazy. I think we're going through a time now, Mr. Reagan gets the, the, uh, the backlash from this. I noticed in the Lynchburg newspaper, it wasn't the Cleveland paper, the Lynchburg newspaper, uh, uh, there were four articles. One article told of a doctor in Boston who was criticizing the president uh, for malnutrition in Boston among children because of the program, uh, the so-called Reaganomics, that went into effect last October 1. Another article was criticizing the president uh, for his um, so-called cutbacks or entitlements and the possibility of the aged being hurt. Then there was another article on his call for additional spending for warheads and then another article on building a $50,000 or less dining room in the White House uh, where the senior staff could meet and work at the same time. All of it intended to imply that Mr. Reagan is against poor people, he's against old people, he's against young people, he's for the war, etc., etc. I've never seen a man so savage by the national media since Watergate as is Mr. Reagan. Well, may I say to you, 
that uh, in the first place, he didn't uh, create those problems. He inherited them. And in the second place, uh, may I say to you that uh, these problems are not going to be corrected this week, next week, next month, or next year. It's going to be a long haul back. We've been on a 49-year drunk before the president came into office. And uh, since 32, forgive me. And it's going to take a long time to come out of withdrawals, uh, withdrawals and DTs before we again are on a solid basis. That's fall well 1-1. One, one. But I uh, do <laughs> believe that it's going, we're at that point now. Mr. Fraser will be here soon, and he will tell you the same thing. We're at that point now where all the taking is over. It's back to the giving bit. It's back to Mr. Kennedy's statement. What can I do? And I think this country needs to get back to work. And I don't mean just in positions. I mean in whatever is available. And I would hope that we all in this room believe that. And the reason I'm for business is because if business succeeds, there will be jobs. And there will be employment. And if we kick the businessmen in the seat of the pants and put business down, there are not going to be any jobs. I was watching with interest the other night, 60 Minutes, in Santa Monica, economic democracy. When they finally pressed them, what does that mean? Uh, they said it means redistribution of the wealth. Oh, that's a different thing. Mr. Hayden now has on a three-piece suit. But nothing's changed underneath a three-piece suit. And we need to remember that. Then there's a fifth principle that I think this nation was built upon. I call it the Abrahamic Covenant. Take that from Genesis 12, Romans 11. I believe that God deals with nations in relation to how those nations deal with the Jews, with Israel. I get a lot of, I'm, I'm on the front cover right now of the U.S. Nazi Party's magazine. And it says, uh, public enemy number one. <laughs> Jerry Falwell, enemy of the white race. I'm not an enemy of the white race, I'm one of them. I think the white race is fine. I just happen to love all the races. I just happen to be for the human race, including the Jewish people. And if Israel ever needed a friend today, uh, it's America. I oppose AWACS. I oppose any deal with the Jordanians, because here's a little nation of three million, surrounded by a hundred million, and many of them are committed to the extinction of that nation. And if anybody on earth, I'm speaking now for the Christian community, if anybody on earth should be for the state of Israel and for Jewish people everywhere, it should be those Christians in this country who believe the Bible and who love God and who have humanitarian principles about them. And I, therefore, believe that God is dealing with America favorably, and that's what's right with America because we have been. Up to this hour, favorable towards and friendly towards the state of Israel and Jewish people everywhere. And may I say that I have more than a theological reason for this. I believe from a legal reason, in 1948, the land belongs to the Jews. Uh, from an historical perspective, there are 4,000 years, there's 4,000 years of history to prove that the land belongs to the Jews. But more than that, I think theologically as a minister of the gospel, you cannot get away from the fact that God told Abraham... I will bless them that bless you, curse them that curse you. And if Adolf Hitler could be lifted out of hell for about 30 seconds today, he'd say amen to that. The Abrahamic Covenant. And then the principle of God-centered education. Not Christ-centered. God-centered education. I was raised up in the public schools and believed very much in the public schools. The only contact I had with a Bible or with a hymn or with a prayer, it was in the public schools. My father was never in a church in his life, as far as I know. And his father before him was an atheist. And I was studying mechanical engineering in college when, as a result of hearing a radio broadcast, Dr. Charles E. Fuller of the Old Fashioned Revival Hour, I heard the gospel of Jesus Christ, his death, his burial, his resurrection. I became a Christian. I was an 18-year-old sophomore in college and I bought my first Bible. It was January 52. Two months later, I felt that I'd like to be a minister of the gospel. And in September of that year, I enrolled at Baptist Bible College, Springfield, Missouri. The only hymns I knew and the only contact I ever had with a prayer was in a public schoolroom. didn't warp me. Now, I'm not for mandated prayers. And I'm certainly not for uh, mandated Bible reading in schools. Whose Bible? 
Buddhist, Muslim, Jewish, Due. I think you can see the constitutional problems there. I'm not for mandated prayers. Praying to whom? For whose name? In publicly funded schools. But I am for the recognition of the existence of God in a, in a nation where 96% of all Americans believe in God. Now, I'm not out to put Madeline in a, in a reservation. I, uh, I think that Madeline has every right to be an atheist and be a first-class citizen with all the privileges uh, pertaining thereto. But she didn't build this country, nor her vintage. And th this nation was built by God-fearing people of the Judeo-Christian ethic. And this nation has become great because of that. And I don't think that a voluntary prayer, a voluntary silent prayer in a public school would be a terrible violation. The recognition of the existence of God. Finally, the principle of divinely ordained institutions. Whether it be the Old or New Testament, only three institutions are ordained, are ordained of God. And they are quickly the home. We've dealt with that the state or civil government, and the religious institution, the Old Testament tabernacle, temple, synagogue, New Testament church. And for any nation, any society to be healthy, those three legs of the tripod must be healthy. We must have healthy homes. I think we need to work for the rebuilding of the traditional family in this country. Number two, we've got to have healthy government. We've had that. Free government, of the people, by the people, for the people. Lately, it's been in spite of the people. And I think the time has come when good people on both sides of the spectrum need to get involved. I'm cussed and discussed by a lot of my dear friends for violating, they say, the principle of separation of church and state. I don't believe in violating that principle. I, I speak as a private citizen. I don't think I must forfeit my citizenship uh, because I happen to be a Christian minister. Mr. Coffin never did. Arrogans never did. When Dr. Martin Luther King, a Baptist minister, led the civil rights movement, and without him it would not have succeeded. Nobody ever yelled separation of church and state violation. But when conservative ministers stand up, and thank God for Dr. King and all he accomplished, but I think of the Coffins and the NCC, the National Council of Church Men who have been marching the halls of Congress for 50 years and have every right to. But when conservative men stand up, everybody has a hernia. You know, what's good for the liberal goose is good for the conservative gander. And uh, we have every right to speak. We're citizens, too. It just happens to be there are more of us. And uh, we, we, we preached to ourselves a few years ago that, uh, that uh, Christians shouldn't be involved in politics. We didn't have any chapter and verse on it. It just sounded good. And it gave us a lot of time uh, just to do what we were doing, pray, read our Bibles, preach, and so forth. That's great. We still do that. We have 19,000 church members, more than a fourth of our city, uh, meets at Thomas Road every Sunday morning. Five services in the day, 4,000 adults each service, and thousands of children. We, we still do all the things we've always done. And if you were at Thomas Road on Sunday morning, you would be hearing what you're hearing right now. I'm here as Jerry Falwell, private citizen. But I think I have the right to speak, and I think thousands of us across this country, everyone has the right to speak. And as long as we don't violate the rights and privileges of others. And what's happening simply is this, that we have a president in the White House who believes in the sanctity of human life and who's taking a stand on those issues, and who believes in the free enterprise system, is trying to reverse a terrible trend towards socialism, and who's trying to rebuild the military defenses of this country, who hates war. Every sensible person hates war. But uh, because the only deterrent to war really is a strong national defense. These people who tell me they are in favor of unilateral disarmament, I always ask the question, do you lock your doors at night? Of course I do. Why can't you trust your neighbors if you trust Russia? The fact is, there's some bad people in the world. This is not the kingdom of heaven. This is the kingdom of earth. And uh, while we hope there will never be another war, the only guarantee there won't be is that we're so tough nobody dares pick on us. And I support the president and what he's doing. I don't know how to do it, but I think he does. So civil government needs to be strong. We need to respect government, obey the powers that be, ordained of God. And then the church. We need a strong church, strong Judeo-Christian institution in this country. And if we have, in, this, in these 1980s, a rebuilding on the principles that I've just talked about, 
And I think it's happening. It's happening in spite of all that others can do about it. That I think we shall see in the years ahead for our children and our children's children, not only as good an America as we have known, but perhaps a better one. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Falwell. Today at the City Club, we are listening to an address by the Reverend Dr. Jerry Falwell on the subject, What's Right with America? We'll go to our question and answer session very shortly. Just let me make a couple of brief announcements. This forum today was sold out, but I want to assure those in our radio and television audience in particular that the membership roles of the City Club are not sold out, and we welcome your participation in this great organization. Please call us at 621-0082 for information about joining. Today, as always, we have as our guests the members of area high schools who are participating in our Living Seminars program, sponsored jointly by the Cleveland Board of Education and the City Club. With us this afternoon are students from the following schools, Berea, Cleveland Heights, Cleveland School of Science, East Tech, Health Career Center, Jane Adams, North Royalton and South High School. Will you young people please stand and receive our welcome. <laughs> Next week's forum will be devoted to the, the uh, finals of the Cleveland High School debate, and the participating high schools will be Shaker Heights and Beechwood on the subject resolved that unions in the United States have too much power. Representing Shaker will be Jennifer Epp, and representing Beechwood will be Robert Maltz. And I would suggest to all of you that this is a forum you will not want to miss. The spectacle of having two young people up here addressing themselves to issues which we as, as adults cannot resolve should be rather edifying. And now for our question and answer session, we have two microphones in the front of the room with Alan Davis in the rear with Bob Cavano. Please make your question brief. And let us have the first question, please. Dr. Falwell. Dr. Falwell, in your description of Judaic Christian principles and their application to American life, national and international, how do you reconcile Jesus' teaching that true greatness is measured not by power, but by humble service? Mark 10. 42, I agree 44. with that. I agree with that. I don't try to reconcile it. I, uh, I believe that as uh, Christians, we have a responsibility, number one, to be poor in spirit, that is, contrite before God, recognizing that He is sovereign. We need to be meek in spirit, that is, preferring one another above ourselves. But I also have, think we have a responsibility our families. It was Jesus also who said, a man who will not care for his household is worse than an infidel or an unbeliever. And if someone broke into my home tonight, and I was there, and uh, they were molesting and injuring my wife and children, and I stood by and watched and did nothing, I think the teaching is I'd be worse than an infidel. And I think that uh, corporately, a government that will not protect its citizenry is worse than infidel. I do not think that we are tempting, and I know where you're coming from, and I've uh, very much uh, uh, understand the dilemma we all face. God knows I wish there were no nuclear, nuclear bomb. I, I wish we'd go past 45 the other way and never have one. But we do have the bomb. Not only do we have it, the Soviet Union has it. Not only do we, two nations, have it, but a lot of other nations. And by the turn of this century, the experts say most of the significant nations, advanced nations, will have the bomb. The question is now, not calling them all in. Where are we going to call them? Who's going to referee? Uh, the fact is, uh, how are we going to prevent them from being used? I think that negotiation must be a part of it. I think that we, uh, we must constantly talk, negotiate, plead, pray, get on our knees, do whatever. But as Teddy Roosevelt said, it, uh, speak softly but carry a big stick. And the only way that we're going to prevent the Soviet Union, uh, unless we can have a real Christian revival over there, uh, the only way we're going to prevent them uh, from taking over the world is to let them know that the that it wouldn't be worth it. Yes. 
If you are so concerned about morality and family life, why is it that you focus so much on sex and ignore issues like cheating on uh, violations on standards for nuclear plants, huge military cost overruns, and why do supporters of, of the moral majority seek to ban federal funds for programs such as help for battered women and children and marriage counseling? Well, we don't do any of those things. I imagine you read that somewhere, but we, um, uh, we very much are opposed to battered women, and we very much, uh, next, uh, <laughs> we, uh, uh, women being battered, that's better said, but um, we, uh, we uh, very much are interested in the, the fact that uh, we do have uh, bureaucratic uh, blunders and dishonesty, because we're taxpayers, too. It bothers us, whether it be the Pentagon or HHS, that's blowing our tax dollars. It's all the same. I don't think the Pentagon's infallible at all. I think just the contrary. I certainly am not here to sanction everything <coughs> that is done by Mr. Haig or anybody else up there. I'm here to say that I do think strength is the only deterrent to war. And I, do, I am here to say that if we were to un unilaterally disarm today, we would not be a free people tomorrow. I don't think there's any question about that, and I hope we never have to prove it to, to anybody to uh, determine we were right. I, I hope that somehow we can keep a consensus and uh, stay behind a president who believes that. Uh, Reverend Powell, as you spoke, it reminded me of a saying in my home state of Massachusetts, that the pilgrims came to this country to worship as they please, and God help those that didn't worship as they please. <laughs> the reason I say this is that I have no argument with the Judeo-Christian ethic, but I think the next century, and these young people you're going to talk to, if we don't destroy, are going to live most of their life in the 21st century, we've got to learn to live in a more pluralistic world. I think your viewpoint may be a bit narrow, and as Winston Churchill once said, to bring the past in an argument with the present is surely to lose the future. Well, I, I certainly believe in pluralism. I wouldn't be here today if I didn't. I uh, do this 20 times a week, by the way. Um, I certainly believe that, um, I think I even made reference to Madeleine O'Hare, and the, I, I think atheists uh, have every right to be atheists. I think they're foolish, but I think they have every right to be atheist. And I don't think there should ever be a, uh, any harassment or persecution of anyone who disagrees with the things that I'm saying today. But what I'm saying is that our point of view has lost by default since World War II because for some reason, we either have been silent or afraid to speak or silent because of other reasons. But I, I would only say that what I'm talking about now has nothing to do with the past. Uh, principles don't change. Uh, right is right today. It's right tomorrow. I do not subscribe to situational ethics. I believe that there are rights and there are wrongs and that they were right and wrong a century ago. They're right and wrong today. I also recognize that there is a... In, in a complex society like ours, of course there must be compromise. Nobody ever gets everything they want, and we wouldn't want them to if they could. But I do believe that unless we all are spokesmen for that for which we believe, what we believe in is going to cease to exist. Reverend Falwell, in discussing your digni uh, the uh, dignity of human life, you mentioned your displeasure with the 1953 Supreme Court decision on, on abortion. I was wondering, though, could I assume, though, that you would favor uh, family planning and sex education in our school system in addition to the family so that we would have no need for some of those types of abortions? I very much favor sex education, and we have it in uh, the schools that we head up. We teach it as biological science. We don't have it as academic pornography, as uh, Saul Gordon and others uh, from Syracuse uh, propose it. But uh, we think that you can teach reproduction, hygiene, anatomy uh, without uh, giving diagrams on how to perform a homosexual act and those kinds of things and teaching non-values or amoral values or even immoral values by our system of values. I, I think that we can, without taking a position, uh, teach purely as biological science and should in our schoolrooms, uh, boys and girls, the facts of life. It has been done for years. It was done when I was in school. And we do it in our Christian schools. There are 18,000 Christian day schools in America today. There are four new ones every day. And uh, we do teach that, and we think we should. 
Reverend Falwell, uh, you said uh, God was angry at, the, uh, at Hitler because uh, he murdered six million Jews. Uh, you're a preacher, so you know more about God than I do. Uh, don't you think God might be angry at us for all the hundreds of thousands of people we murdered in Southeast Asia and are continuing to murder in Central America by, so by supporting bloody dictatorships? Well, of course, that's your opinion, and I respect it. But I don't look on our attempt to stop or prevent another nation in Central America El Salvador from becoming another Nicaragua, another Cuba. By the way, no meeting like this is happening in Cuba or Nicaragua today. Uh, I don't think that's murder. I think that's the protection of free, pe uh, free people and the protection of the dignity of human life principle that I spoke about. South Vietnam, I wish we'd never gone there. Uh, we did go there. Uh, I personally feel that... Um, there are many atrocities there on both sides. Don't try to justify either side in it. But that doesn't change the idea of the fact that when President Kennedy and then later presidents put us there, I don't think they had in mind destroying human life there. I think they had in mind protecting the cause of freedom for that part of the world, although we failed. Reverend Falwell. Will you please explain the uh, philosophy of humanism, and also do you feel that it has a place with issues today? Thank you. Well, do you mean secular humanism? Um, or yes. What, uh, okay. Uh, secular humanism, very simply defined, is that philosophy which has man at the center of everything, and man is the measure of all things. That does not accept the uh, fact that there is a creator God who created us for the pleasure of God. And therefore, there is no God to whom we will one day give an account when this life is over. And so that uh, idea that I got here by accident, I'm here to do my own thing, and that I am my ultimate goal, uh, normally and naturally spawns situational ethics. Since, uh, since I'm only an animal, and when I die, I'll cease to be, and there will be no account given. Uh, then eat, drink, be merry, tomorrow I die. And that ultimately leads to anarchy. It is uh, it's a matter of fact that there are absolutes in any civilized society. And I, uh, every society is ruled by the legislation of morality by consensus. You can't kill, you can't steal, you can't commit rape. Because somebody decided on the principles that I talked about today that is not good for the majority of people. Uh, secular humanism, taken to its uh, logical conclusion, uh, would nullify the fact that there are any absolutes. And that uh, eventually, under any given circumstance, anything is all right. And I reject that. Dr. Falwell, it appears that you're wearing a microphone attached to your tie, and it appears that you're recording these remarks uh, yourself. Is this because you have had uh, such experiences with the media, you find it necessary to keep a constant check on uh, what you're saying in public? No, sir. Uh, this camera... Over, uh, where's the camera crew? <laughs> There's a camera crew here. Put a microphone in my pocket. Uh, it's, uh, it's a little, it is our crew. But we're filming that for someone else who asked for it. And uh, we, uh, my problem is not uh, usually being misquoted. Uh, it's being quoted properly. <laughs> In uh, one of television's finest hours, in my judgment, last Sunday was uh, Norman Lear's production of I Love Liberty. I don't know if you saw that. Oh, yes, I watched it carefully. It took a lot of discipline. I, the question I have for you is, don't you think it would be a good idea, then, in the inspirational spirit of that program, to add another principle here, maybe eliminate a few, but not the first one, of course, but to add the principle of tolerance, which would be undergirding American pluralism? Well, I, I wrote Mr. Lear about that and asked him, you know, since uh, he was given the two hours by ABC, plus a million dollars, later a million eight, uh, to present that. I wrote a letter to him with a copy to ABC and to the FCC asking, in the name of fairness and um, academic freedom, that I be allowed to appear with him on it. 
And if not I, then maybe the Liberty Baptist College singers, uh, choir, whatever, we were denied categorically the right down because what they mean by the First Amendment is my right, not yours, to speak. That's what Mr. Learman's. And uh, so we didn't get on. But I watched it carefully because I had heard that it was going to be an attack on me, and I didn't want to hear what he said. About halfway through, one hour in, I called six friends who were supposed to be watching. All had switched, two, five had switched to the towering inferno. Another, <laughs> another was watching the NIT, and I learned yesterday that it came in 41 out of 68 programs last week. And so it was a fiasco, but I, it, um, uh, the idea, you know, I like what he was saying. I agreed with everything I heard. One or two exceptions. I didn't think Jane fitted there too well, but I, I, I agreed with everything I saw there. And appreciated it, except that I wondered if Mr. Lear did, you know, because we uh, we would like to have been on there with him. And, uh, you know, if he asked to appear on my show, he'd get on. He really would, any time he wants. And uh, that's, uh, that's a fact. But that's neither here nor there. Uh, I, think, I think that I am tolerant. I, I think that we are uh, simply saying what we believe. The folks who are marching outside and passing out the leaflets have every right to do that. You might say that's intolerance. I don't think it is. I think they're exercising their constitutional right to oppose me peacefully. I think I have a constitutional right to oppose them peacefully. And somewhere down the road, the name of the game is persuasion. Uh, whoever can persuade the most people in the long haul and produce the consensus uh, usually gets the direction, accomplishes the goal. So I would simply say uh, I, I don't want to come off intolerant. I try never to. But if I sound that way, I apologize. I don't mean to. Uh, Reverend Fowler, uh, in your earlier remarks, you referred to the fact that your picture was on the cover of a Nazi publication. I'm not sure that I understand exactly why they used your picture on the cover. Would you Well, uh, the Nazi party is very anti-black, anti-Jewish. I'm very pro-black, pro pro-Jewish, pro-everybody, and I, um, I happen to be a, a supporter of Mr. Begin also, and that is not necessarily a, a most favorable thing at the Nazi party meeting every night. Sir, do the Judeo-Christian principles prescribe the free enterprise system? And if they do, how? All right, sir. Uh, I feel that freedom is the basis of the free enterprise system, the right to own property. Uh, if you live in the Soviet Union, you'd appreciate that a great deal. Uh, the right to compete, the right by initiative, and even taking a chance to get ahead or lose, and the right to start over, and, and the right after you have achieved and accomplished to keep what you have. The free enterprise system in this country, I personally think the government for the last 20 or 30 years has been the enemy of the free enterprise system. Uh, I can't imagine that the government has been anything but uh, opposed to business. And I think that to be to allow the free enterprise system to go down in this country uh, is very much interrelated with everything else we believe in. Uh, that if the businessman is no longer free, none of us are. And if he can't compete, and if a man's willing in this redistribution of, uh, of wealth, that's a lot of hogwash. Uh, if a man works for something and works longer than somebody else does and uh, lives by the rules and is honest and achieves, he has every right to have what he has as much as the person who is not willing to work as long uh, to accept his mediocrity. And I don't think that the business community in this country and the businessman is, the, is our enemy. I think they're our friends. Well, what are your views on racism and sexism as it relates to your principle of the dignity of human life? Well, I guess I could best say that from the Christian principle that I don't think God is colorful. I think we're all the creatures of God, and that Christ died for all men. I pastor a church in Lynchburg, Virginia, that is probably the most integrated church in the nation. I don't know of any church that has more minorities and mixtures of everybody in it than our church does. If you came there, Thomas Rowan, any Sunday, I think you would say that's true. I uh, head up a school system that has the same percentage of minorities as our area does. Uh, total admission. I can only say that uh, I think racism 
uh, is a result uh, not just of bigotry, but it's uh, really a rebellion against Almighty God who created us all in His image. Uh, the problem with uh, the, the reason the Soviets can justify their persecution of Jews now, or anybody, to accomplish their goal, is because they don't believe in God. So what if, uh, if there is no God, man is not made in the image of God, so why not destroy him? The reason the Nazis, the fascists, can, uh, can uh, accommodate their anti-people, anti-black, anti-Jewish positions because they, uh, they might deny that they believe this, but it's obvious they do not have a concept of a God who has made man in his image. Uh, racism is a re rebellion against God's very creative act. And I would, um, I don't know if, uh, if that's what the answer you wanted or not, but um, that's my belief. Sexism. I happen to believe that um, uh, God uh, made men and women equally precious, equally important to Him, uh, with, uh, with responsibilities and functions unique to each other. Um, I believe in equality for women. I believe a woman should make as much money as any man doing the same job that man does with the same opportunities for advancement. I, I guess you're referring to my op opposition of the amendment. I feel the amendment had it succeeded, and I think it's a dead issue, but had it succeeded, would not have brought equality to womanhood, but possibly could have, by court interpretation, forced all women uh, into combat situations or sanctioned uh, homosexual marriages, penalized, deserted wives, so many things that I think would have been demeaning. And I think now with June 30 coming around and the burial, the second burial of the amendment, I think we need to... Uh, now prove our sincerity by moving strongly ahead to guarantee that any place, anywhere that equality does exist, uh, from our perspective, make it exist. I think that is where I stand on sexism. Sir, uh, supporting the destruction of human life in Central America to protect the dignity of human life, isn't that situational ethics? I don't think so. Less than one minute. Uh, I think that anybody who is looking at the facts will have to admit that Nicaragua is nothing more now than Castro and Brezhnev's conduit, the revolution in all of Central America, eventually Mexico, and I think further north than that, and that uh, we are simply protecting our children by doing what the president is doing there. I don't see that at all as any violation of, uh, of ethics and in the enforcement of ethics when one protects their children. Dr. Paul Wallace, City Club Town is adjourned.